Let's continue looking at genetics and heredity. Now remember genetics is all about the study of heredity, the passing of information from one generation to the next. Now this also explains how certain characteristics are passed to the offspring. Offspring often look quite a bit like the mother and the father. That information is passed from those two individuals. There are many ways to categorize cells, but often when you talk about genetics and how the cells of the body have been categorized, you hear about most of them being called somatic cells. Then there's one particular cell type in the body called the gametes, which are very different. Now the somatic cells are also called diploid cells. Think of the diploid, the D for double, because they have got twice as many chromosomes as what the gametes do. If you look at almost every cell in your body, it's going to have 46 chromosomes. You've got 23 from mom, 23 from dad, 23 pairs, or 46 is what they'll have. But when you get to the gametes, which are the reproductive cells of the body, they have half that much. When you hear about haploid cells, think about half as many chromosomes as most cells have. So that would just be 23, again, where other cells of the body are going to have 46. Looking at Mendelian genetics, which is named after Gregor Mendel, a monk, who got an interest started in all of this here. These are some other terms which you'll always see used with genetics, like genotype and phenotype. Genotype is the actual set of alleles for a trait. In other words, the forms of the genes for something particular in the body, like maybe, say, eye color. Phenotype, a person's appearance, think of that as the outward expression of those genes. So if the genotype is, say, the alleles needed for eye color, the phenotype would be green, blue, brown, or whatever that person's eye color is. You'll also hear about genes being categorized as dominant and recessive. Dominant genes are, in general, the good ones, the ones you do want to see expressed in the body, and they tend to override or mask the effects of recessive genes, which are generally undesirable. You'll also hear about sex-linked traits. These are genes found on the last pair of chromosomes. When you look at that 23rd pair of chromosomes, they come up in practically everybody, XX or XY, unless something went very wrong in the very first parts of development, which is a different story. So that 23rd pair, XX or XY, those are the ones, ones that determine the gender of an individual. XX gives a female, XY will give a male. Some other terms you hear about homozygous and heterozygous. Homozygous means you're having two of the same alleles for a trait. Now, if you look down here, you can see that homozygous alleles come up in one of two ways. Homozygous dominant or recessive. Now, the dominant genes are always represented by capital letters, and the recessive genes by lowercase. So if someone's homozygous dominant, that means they've got two of the dominant genes. That's why you see two of the uppercase A's here. Homozygous recessive, where an individual has two recessive genes. That's why you see two lowercase A's here. Heterozygous is where you have one dominant, one recessive. So that's why here you see one capital letter and one lowercase. And again, looking at chromosomes, genetics is all about the study of heredity. And that DNA, found mostly in the nucleus, but a little bit of it in the mitochondria too, is the instructions for those cells. It tells them how to make proteins and also controls what the cell does. You may have also seen with chromosomes something called a karyotype, which is a map of someone's chromosomes. If you take those 23 pairs of chromosomes and arrange them from large to small, you'll see the biggest ones first going down to the smaller ones, and then the very last 23rd pair will be those sex chromosomes. Again, they either come up XX or XY, given a female or a male. And there are thousands of genes on each one of those chromosomes. You'll also hear about the diploid and haploid. We saw that once before. Again, almost every cell of the body is diploid they got double the set that a haploid does. So almost every cell of your body's got 23 pairs, 46 chromosomes. Haploid, again, half that, 23. And again, the karyotype is actually a visual picture of someone's chromosomes. Now let's also compare mitosis and meiosis. These are two very similar processes, but of course they have some very big exceptions. Now if cells of your body can divide and make more of themselves, Practically all cells of the body go through mitosis. Only the reproductive cells of the body, sperm cells and the oocytes, go through, go through the process of meiosis. Now let's compare these two, mitosis and meiosis. Mitosis, where you always go from one cell to two. 
meiosis, notice, is one cell to four. Mitosis will involve one cellular division, and then everything starts over. Meiosis will involve two divisions. Again, with mitosis, all cells of the body, except the reproductive cells, if they can divide, will go through mitosis. But again, only the gametes, the reproductive cells, go through meiosis. And mitosis will always pass on 23 pairs, 46 chromosomes, to each one of those new cells called daughter cells. But meiosis passes half that, 23 chromosomes. Now, if we look over here to the left, let's say we start off with our mother cell. And it starts off in interphase, and it grows, and it makes an extra copy of the DNA. So there will be two complete sets of the DNA. The cell will go through prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, which remember your stages of mitosis. The cell will divide, passing on a complete set of genetic information. But these two daughter cells will go back into interphase. They'll grow, make an extra copy of the DNA, and the whole thing just keeps on repeating itself. Now, if we come over here and look at meiosis, the mother cell at the top started with interphase and make an extra copy of the DNA. Then it goes through mitosis, just like the cells on the left, passing a complete set of genetic information, just like those in my, mitosis did. But here's the big difference. After this first cellular division in meiosis, these two new daughter cells skip interphase. If you skip interphase, you skip copying the genetic, genetic information. So these here won't make an extra copy. They'll keep just that one complete set and that's it. And then they'll go through mitosis again. And if you split those cells in half, they will end up with half copies of DNA. So basically with meiosis, you go through two divisions instead of one and you skip that interphase in between. You skip interphase and don't make an extra copy of the genetic information and split those cells a second time, you're going to pass half copies. And again, that's what the reproductive cells of the body do. That is how they're formed. So again, talking about inheritance of gender, there can only be male and female. Well, again, that last set of chromosomes comes up either XX or XY. You figure when that 23rd pair of chromosomes splits in females, they can only pass an X. That's all they have to pass. But a male could pass an X or a Y, it's a 50-50 chance of either one. So where females are always passing an X to the reproductive cells, a male could pass an X or a Y. So that's why it is the male that determines the gender of the offspring. Female can only pass an X, male might pass an X, he might pass a Y. 50-50 chance of each. XX gives a female, XY will give a male. So that's the 23rd pair of chromosomes determining the gender. And here we also see a little simple Punnett square. Punnett squares are often used to visualize what are the probabilities of certain outcomes of genes. Now, just one example of a Punnett square is shown here. Let's say we have a father which is heterozygous for a particular trait. Remember, heterozygous means difference. Here we see a capital and a lowercase. He has a dominant and a recessive gene. We see the same thing over here for the mother. So what you do is look at this picture which shows the four possible combinations. What could be passed from each gender and how could they recombine in the new individual? Well, again, we take this heterozygous set of information from the mother and father. So we're going to take here the dominant from the mother and the dominant from the father. and We put them together. Here we take the dominant from the mother, the recessive from the father, and put them together. Here we take the recessive from the mother, the dominant from the father, and put them together. And then lastly, what's left are the two recessive. Now again, when it comes to dominant and recessive genes, generally the dominant are the ones that are desired, the ones you want, because that tells the cell how to do something properly. But the recessive genes often cause trouble. Now as long as an individual has at least one of those dominant genes, they'll probably function normally, or at least mostly they will. But with two recessive genes, they may not. So when you look at the case of these individuals here with mother and father, they are carriers of a recessive gene. They have a dominant gene, so they probably function normally, but they are carrying a recessive. And if you look at the probabilities of how these letters could match up, notice there's a one in four chance that any offspring could end up with both those recessive genes. And that's often undesired, causing some type of trouble in that individual. 
So we've seen this information with these chromosomes before. Again, homologous chromosomes are pairs where one's from the father, one's from the mother. The locus or loci, think of this as the location. That's what that's sort of an abbreviation for of a gene on a chromosome. And there are many genes on individual chromosomes. Alleles, remember, are different forms of the same gene. We've seen these before. And just mention a little on genetic disorders. You could talk about abnormalities in DNA. If something goes wrong with the DNA, it often causes a problem. Mutations in DNA often are not good. They are usually bad. Now, these genetic disorders could be congenital, might be present at the time of birth. Birth defects aren't necessarily genetic. There are other things which can cause them. Teratogens are agents that cause birth defects. Many things can, especially foreign chemicals. That's why pregnant females often want to avoid any type of foreign chemical, medications, and so on. Some of those can cause serious birth defects. Mutations. A mutagen is any agent that causes a mutation in the genes. Usually that deviation is not going to be good. And when you look at cancers or tumors, these are always cells which are growing out of control. It's like they're stuck in mitosis. And then also the cells don't develop properly. When you look at cancers and some common terms seen with them, oncogenes is one you may have heard of before. These are genes associated with cancers. Many problems we have with individuals today and diseases are from cancer genes. Genes do things other than cause cancers, but cancer always involves a problem with the DNA. Usually something's missing or rearranged. There are also tumor suppressor genes, which help to prevent cancers, carcinogens, or anything which can cause a cancer. And again, there is genetic susceptibility to it. Often a person's genetics can be looked at and possible problems could be identified in the future. Here's some pictures of mitosis once again that was in a previous PowerPoint, a little drawing right here and links to the books.